study is what you do with other people, writes black studies poet philosopher Fred Moten in his book with Stefan O'Harney, The Undercommons. It's talking and walking around with other people, working, dancing, suffering, some irreducible convergence of all three held under the name of speculative practice. Welcome to the Black Studies Open University, the spring event series of the Abolition Democracy Fellows Program of the Black Studies Collaboratory, housed in the Department of African American Studies here at UC Berkeley. Blackity black, 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 black. Um, today's program, Ebony Visions and Cowrie Shell Dreams, Black Storytelling and Children's Literature Across the Generations, has been curated by Abolition Democracy Elder in Residence, seasoned Elder in Residence, Miss Daphne Muse. Um, and is the first of nine events in our Black Studies Open University Spring Series. My name is Lee Rayford. I am professor of African American Studies, and along with Dr. Tiana S. Bichelle, co-director of the Black Studies Collaboratory. The BSC is a three-year initiative to explore and amplify the world-building work of black studies. With generous funding from the Mellon Foundation's Just Futures grant, we have, over the course of the first two years, welcomed artists, activists, archivists, and elders into the campus community, produced a robust event series in partnership with units on campus, around the Bay, and across the country, we have awarded some 30 grants of about $5,000 each to students, faculty, and staff to support innovative, black-centered, collaborative pro projects, more than a third of which involved, have involved collaboration with off-campus partners. We have supported the research and development of more than two dozen black feminist scholars around the country and across the globe. And we are building long-term partnerships with black-centered Bay Area organizations that are doing phenomenal work in health, education, art, and food justice. And you can find out more about our work at our website, blackstudiescollab.berkeley.edu. We need to begin um, with an acknowledgement of our place and our time. We are here at the Berkeley Art Museum at the threshold of UC Berkeley's campus in the city of Berkeley, sited on the territory of the Hutun, the ancestral and unceded land of the Chechenyo speaking Ohlone, the successors of the historic and sovereign Verona band of Alameda County. We recognize that every member of both Berkeley, all Berkeley communities, have and continue to benefit from the use and occupation of this land. In acknowledging the history, the Ohlone history of this land, we acknowledge that Ohlone people are thriving members of this community who are actively imagining more just futures and engaging the tools that are needed to do that imaginative work. One way to make concrete such an acknowledgement is through the payment of Shumi land tax, a material way for non-indigenous people living in the East Bay to participate in the rematriation of land to indigenous peoples and you can find out more about Shumi land tax through the Sagaria Tay Land Trust. As we acknowledge the place where we gather, I also want to acknowledge the time we gather. I want to acknowledge the grief and fear and rage we feel as we protest another state murder of a black citizen. Rest in power, Tyree Nichols. Hashe. And on this first day of Black History Month, I want to note that the College Board has buckled under far right wing pressure and has stripped down its advanced placement African American studies curriculum, specifically to eliminate the fundamental contributions of black feminist, black queer, and black radical traditions to African American studies. And so here we are, and that's why we gather today. The series, The Black Studies Open University, is an effort to better understand the history and future of black life on stolen lands. It is a refusal to consume our demise on autoplay 
or to whittle our dreams down to what can fit into the tiniest of boxes or the most banal of diversity, equity, and inclusion statements. The Black Studies Open University is a commitment to Black Studies as a public good. We are inspired by the legacy of community campus pedagogical partnerships, like the Afro-American Association Reading Group of the 1960s and the undergraduate-led democratic education at, Ye uh, at Cal, DECAL courses. We are inspired by SNCC's freedom schools and the political education classes of the Black Panther Party. And we take our name from the Open University in the UK, spearheaded by the late great Stuart Hall, whose work provides an example of the pinnacle of intellectual pursuits performed for the public and in the public interest. So too is the Black Studies Open University a recognition that knowledge is produced, circulated, and put into use in a range of locations, from the kitchen table to the seminar room, from the street corner to the concert stage, from the prison cell to the lecture podium. And above all, the Black Studies Open University is an invitation. It's an invitation to a mode of study that is always social and necessarily collaborative. We have work to do. <laughs> it is an invitation to dream together and practice for new, more just ways of living. So we hope that you will join us as often as you can throughout this series. Please tell a friend, tell your, tell your mother, tell your father, tell us, send a telegram, um, <laughs> if you will. Um, and so before I turn uh, to my moderating duties, I want to thank the beautiful collective of people who've made today and this series possible. We are thrilled to be partnering on this series with the Berkeley Art Museum and Pacific Film Archive, helmed by director Julie Rodriguez Whittlem. Uh, and the Osher Theater team have been great. I want to thank Nat Reeves, Reeves, Dave Taylor, Taylor McAllister, Taylor Coburn, and the whole Banffa staff. Always big thanks and gratitude uh, to our BSC project manager extraordinaire, Barbara Montano. <laughs> BSC graduate student assistants, Francesca Araujo and Alexandra Gassesi. The Department of African American Studies, helmed brilliantly by Chair Professor Nikki Jones, with incredible staff support from Lindsay Villarreal, Sandy Richmond, and Maria Edadia. I want to thank our ASL interpreters, Kat, who is next to me, and Benny from Pro Bono ASL, the Andrew Mellon Foundation. I want to thank today's panelists. Cheryl and Wade Hudson, who will be joining us via Zoom, Dr. Awan Mance, Crystal and Sanders Diggs, we thank you all for making the time to join us today. I want to thank seasoned elder in residence and BSC North Star, Ms. Daphne Muse, and her undergraduate research assistant, Abby Simmons. We want to thank the ancestors who are with us always, and we thank you for joining us today. Um, so Ebony Visions and Cowrie Shell Dreams, Black Storytelling and Children's Literature Across the Generations. Uh, this is a conversation on the legacy of black children's literature and the writers who continue telling stories that tap into the imagination and pay homage to black futures. Um, I will introduce the panelists one by one uh, as they come up to the podium to offer comments on their work and on the theme today, after which we will sit together on stage and moderate, uh, and I'll moderate a conversation. So let me begin with Ms. Daphne Muse. Since migrating to the Bay Area from Washington, D.C. in 1971, Daphne Muse has been an unflagging caretaker and activist, dedicating herself to the intersections between education, neighborhood organization, public exhibitions, and literature. Shortly after arriving, she became the secretary of the Angela Davis Legal Defense Team. During those years, Ms. Muse also advocated for the founding 
of African Americans of the African American Studies Department here at UC Berkeley, and later became a teacher um, at UC Berkeley under Dr. William Bill Banks, and hoping that she will return again. Um, and she also taught for many years at Mills College. Ms. Muse saw herself as an ambassador between the university and the lives of the nearby marginalized, then referred to as third world, communities. She often organized large scale public programs and thoughtfully curated exhibitions in order to bring these communities into conversation. And we have learned so much from Ms. Muse, not only from your work as a writer, um, but really also from your work as a caretaker, as an organizer, um, you really guide our work. And so with that, I give it over to Ms. Daphne Muse. Thank you, Professor Rayford. I really appreciate all of you taking time out of the demands of your day to join us. Um, I'd first like to start off by introducing the Black Joy Scholars sitting next to me. Um, they hold an endowed chair in my office. And there's a little cup next to the chair. Any of you who want to donate to the endowment, we'll welcome your coins to that. They bring me great inspiration, and they keep me anchored on those days that I'm ready to go buck wild. So, um, Nana, Nana, read to me. Nana, Nana, read to me. Show me that you care. Teach me how to learn the words that can take me anywhere. Nana, Nana, read to me. Tell the stories, too. Nana, Nana, read to me so I won't feel so blue. Nana, Nana, read to me. Fill up all my soul. Nana, Nana, read to me so I'll be smart and whole. Though his spirit will continue to alley-oop around his four-year-old son's heart tonight and for all the nights to come, Tyree Nichols won't be reading him a bedtime story. The legacy of intergenerational black storytelling has traversed slavery, white supremacy, decades of book banning, and has been a cultural connective tissue across the diaspora for centuries. As the hulls of the ships filled with shackled bodies of enslaved Yoruba, Igbo, Bakongo, and people from hundreds of other African villages and cities navigated the icy and treacherous waters of the Atlantic upon departure from doors of no return, mothers had to steal their souls and bomb the terror seizing the tender souls of their children in the tongues of their mothers, villages, and nations, they whispered stories passed from one generation to the next. Once shared under baobao trees in villages filled with indigo dye masters, metalsmiths, teachers, healers, warriors, astronomers, and archivists. Centuries old fables and tales, including Anansi and the Pot of Wisdom, the Tortoise and the Hare, and a mother's love, a story of two crows, were among them. Their liberation lullabies and folk tales cast the mold for future generations of freedom fighters. After arriving on these shores and auctioned on the slave blocks from New Orleans to Washington, D.C., where it was outlawed as part of the 1850 Compromise, in secret, many traditions continued to be carried forward and the arc of storytelling across the diaspora prevails. Though enslaved people were labeled illiterate, many were literate in the primary languages which they were forbidden to speak. Early African orthographies or writing systems dating back to 300 BC are well documented beyond the hieroglyphics of Egyptians. Today, I brought an example of a book published in 2004 called African Alphabets, the story of writing in Africa, 
we were a literate people before we were enslaved. With some estimates noting that at least 20% of those enslaved were African Muslims, Arabic, which was spoken and written since the first century, was one language spoken and read by those who worked the fields and kitchens of plantation owners. In Sabidi, a Nigerian system of written symbols that dates back 2000 BC, predating Gutenberg's 15th century printing press as the age of European enlightenment was rising. A major library and written manuscripts date back to the 14th century in Mali, while the literacy rate in England was noted as being around 30% for men and almost non-existent for women as late as the 17th century. But despite every effort to criminalize learning and the word, people crafted ingenious and clandestine ways to read and write in English, where allies like the Quakers were instrumental in teaching them to read and the church and the Bible became acceptable platforms in many regions in ongoing efforts to remove any and everything African about enslaved people. In 1817, the first African-American firm to issue children's books was the AME Book Concern, founded in Philadelphia by the African-American Methodist Episcopal Church. The church was deemed a relatively safe harbor for such publications for every effort to remove the religious and spiritual practices of enslaved people was enforced. In 1887, Amelia E. Johnson, the wife of a Baltimore minister, founded The Joy, an eight-page monthly periodical for African-American children. And in 1889, Johnson wrote Clarence and Corrine, or God's Way, published by the American Baptist Publication Society, a white administered organization. In 1896, they also published ju juvenile, juvenile literature demanded on part of colored children. Contrary to popular belief, Ezra Jack Keats' A Snowy Day was not the first black children's book, but the rise of consciousness in the 20th century led by author scholar W.E.B. Du Bois and Harlem Renaissance writer Jesse Redmond Fawcett led to the publication of the Brownies Books, a monthly magazine that included fiction, poetry, and a clever column called As the Crow Flies. And the crow was ingenious. The crow went all over the world gathering stories about black people in Europe, black people in the diaspora. It was a cunning and very sophisticated column. And I wish that the magazine only lasted two years and how I wish that it could be brought back. And magazines were relatively, quote, affordable, where books cost more money. So it was very difficult for families to purchase books for their children. While these magazines dating back to the late 19th century had some impact on young readers, many of the books have ascended to the realm of classics now housed in public libraries and classrooms across the country and read by multiple generations. We can't minimize the role 20th century librarians Augusta Baker and trailblazing author and storyteller as well and New York City's Barbara Rollick played in creating repositories for stories still, held, still being told, biographies written, and historical events documented, documented through the works of Alexis DeVoe, author and illustrator Tom Feelings, and YA author Walter Dean Myers. From Shirley Graham, who was writing under the name Shirley Graham before she married W.E.B., John Steptoe and Eloise Greenfield to Virginia Hamilton and Cheryl and Wade Hudson, we now have multiple generations of young people nurtured, inspired, and educated from books written by authors who ascended to the heights of the field, winning prestigious awards, gaining followings of millions of readers, though not the Harry Potter following. 
millions, but we still got some millions, and whose anthologies, biographies, and novels are included in curriculum projects across the country and around the world. Writers primarily known for their adult fiction and poetry also have contributed significantly to the field, including poet and novelist Gwendolyn Brooks, poet Lucille Clifton, poet and essayist June Jordan, and writer James Baldwin. Clifton's groundbreaking All Us Come Cross the Water, published in 1973, tells the endearing story of a little boy's discovery of his African roots and was hailed as a stepping stone in the literature. The legendary roots of storytelling drummed up out of our ancestral villages and cities in Ghana, Mali, and Benin have expanded into a range of genres, including award-winning novels, legendary folk tales, comic books, graphic novels, picture books that include illustrations by Faith Ringo, Basquiat, John Steptoe, Tom's Feelings, Floyd Cooper, and Keterab Ebobo. The canon of black children's literature also has been researched and documented by scholars including Donna Ray McCann, Gloria Woodard, Violet Harris, and contemporary scholars John de McNair and Wanda Brooks. And our books have ascended into the realm of classics with Virginia Hamilton's M.C. Higgins the Great winning a John Newberry, the equivalent of a Nobel in my estimation, in 1975. It set a course for major recognition of black young adult literature. Jacqueline Woodson's The House You Pass on the Way gained her major recognition with an appointment as ambassador for young people at the Library of Congress, becoming the recipient of a Coretta Scott King Award and a 2020 MacArthur Genius Award. Um, I should back up and note that Hamilton won a MacArthur in 1974 or 1975. I have to fact check my date on that. Um, but the field needs so many more scholars and writers contributing to the canon, despite epic efforts to ban the ancestral and contemporary voices who continue to restore, rise, and resonate for generations to come. These emerging writers, poets, and illustrators are standing on the shoulders of our ancestral griots, including Sundiata Amali, Kristen Hunter, Dinga McCannon, Kadir Nelson, Leo and Diane Dillon, and Javaka Steptoe. The announcement of this year's John Newberry and Coretta Scott King Awards has become are beacons of hope as the voices of more black writers continue, children's writers, continue to lift our stories out of the margins into the realm of national and world literature. This year, debut children's author Amina Lukman Dawson won the John Newberry Prize. She graduated from UC Berkeley with an MA in public health. Her, her novel pens a lyrical, accessible, historical middle grade novel about two enslaved children's escape from a plantation and, many way, and the many ways they find freedom. The Coretta Scott King Awards for recognizing African American uh, authors and illustrators of outstanding books for children this year went to Frank Morrison for Standing in the Need of Prayer um, and the Coretta Scott John Steptoe New Talent Award went to illustrator Janelle Washington, um, Choosing Brave, and author Joss Hammonds, We Deserve Monuments. Um, the Coretta Scott King Virginia Hamilton Award for Lifetime Achievement went to Claudette McLean. To Young Readers by Gwendolyn Brooks, dedicated to the children of Chicago for the International Year of the Child, 1979. Good books are bandages and voyages, and linkages to light are keys and hammers, ripe redeemers, dials and bells, healing, hallelujah. Good books are good nutrition. A reader is a guest nourished by the rich riches of the feast to lift, to launch, and to applaud the world. 
From funding provided by the Black Studies Collaboratory, I will be donating a series of children's books to the Roots Clinic in Oakland, to Gia White of the Steering Committee member for Black Lives at Cal, and the Chosen for Change Foundation in honor of Michael Brown Jr. and courtesy of the graduate student fellow, Rashad Timmons. I'd like to thank the panelists, my colleagues in the Black Studies Collaboratory, and all of you who took the time out from the demands of your day to attend this panel. I hope you will join in on the upcoming panels being presented by scholars, artists, activists, and our culinary wizard, bringing their visions and voices forward in this series. And I'm especially grateful to my research associate, Abigail Simmons. Um, I would now like to turn the panel over to uh, the next speakers. Mike is still hot and electric, Miss Muse. <laughs> Our next panelists are joining us uh, via Zoom, Cheryl and Wade Hudson. Um, in 1988, keenly aware of the need for more books for young people that celebrate and center black people, history and experiences, Wade Hudson and Cheryl Willis Hudson founded Just Us Books. Grounded in the belief that good books make a difference, Just Us Books set out to publish the kind of positive affirming titles that the couple wanted for their own two children. Under the Hudson's leadership, Just Us Books has become an institution in the publishing industry and black community and remains one of the nation's few black owned presses. In 2008, the Hudson's launched Marimba Books, an imprint that focuses on multicultural literature for children. As publishers, authors, and editors, the Hudson's have helped bring to market the hundred, hundreds of diverse children's books that inspire, educate, entertain, and allow children to see themselves reflected in stories. Wade and Cheryl have received many awards for their contributions to children's literature, including induction into the International Literary Hall of Fame for Writers of African Descent, the Harlem Book Fair Phyllis Wheatley Award, the Ida B. Wells Institutional Leadership Award presented by the Center for Black Literature, the Madam C.J. Walker Legacy Award given by the Zora Neale Hurston Richard Wright Foundation, um, Children's Book Council's Diversity Achievement Award, and a 20 22 Eric Carl honor. Great. Well, thank you so much. We are honored and delighted to be a part of uh, this uh, discussion. And we want to first thank the Black Studies Collaboratory and our seasoned elder, uh, Daphne Muse, Sister Daphne, whom we love and appreciate for all the wonderful work that she has done um, in children's literature and in Black Studies and just for humanity. Wade and I are going to be talking about publishing. We're going to be talking about our development as uh, writers and primarily uh, talking about publishing as an institution um, that has grown and uh, really rests on the shoulders of so many of our ancestors and predecessors. So Wade is going to, we're going to kind of go back and forth with a, a show and tell. So you can take a look at the slides as we give some general comments. And Daphne has done such a wonderful job. I think she, she uh, had some insight into some of our slides as well. So you may hear some of the same things that she was talking about. Wade's going to start, and we'll go back and forth. It, it should take about 15 minutes. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, can you go to the next slide, please? Uh, when Cheryl and I started our company, Just Us Books, in 1988, we were not aware of the rich history and legacy of Black book publishing. But Black people have always, always fought to define ourselves, to share our experiences and tell our stories, 
even as others sought to define us. White slave owners and the institution that they built uh, to enslave black people declared that we were uncivilized and subhuman. We were better off, they said, roaming the jungles on what they call the dark continent. Rudyard Kipling summed it up in a poem he published, next slide please, in 1899, entitled, The White Man's Burden. Lines from the poem uh, are on the screen now to the far left, and these are some of the books uh, that he uh, wrote. And yes, this is the same Kipling who wrote The Jungle Book and Kim and Captain Courageous. Although the white man's burden was written several centuries after slavery was instituted, it captured the widely held view that whites held regarding people of color and black people. But uh, we had another story. Next slide, please. Black people were determined to express their own creative gifts. You'll see Lucy Terry, Moses Horton, Phyllis Wheatley, who are among the early poets in the United States. Note this, before her collection, Poems on Various Subjects, Religious and Morals, was released in 1773, Phyllis Wheatley had to go to court in 1772 in Boston to define her authorship uh, and to defend her authorship of that piece of literature. Next slide, please. But uh, traditionally, and a little bit later, and through the ages, uh, Black people continued to write and also express themselves. And in 1827, John Russworm and um, Samuel B. Cornish wrote in their editorial of the first Black newspaper, we wish to plead our own cause. Too often or too long has the public been deceived by misrepresentations in things which concern us dearly. Next slide, please. So we have the emergence, and we're jumping through history here to show how we have expressed ourselves in literature. Um, Paul Lawrence Dunbar, The Emergence of Black Writers During the Hall of Renaissance, Fire Magazine, um, Journal, uh, Langston Hughes, Zora Neale Hurston, all of these people were uh, excellent writers who struggled uh, amidst great uh, pressure to get their work published to the public, to express themselves in their own words rather than through the lenses of uh, white authors. Next slide, please. Also during this period, Langston Hughes was an award-winning uh, poet author, radio announcer, playwright. He, he, he was a Renaissance man. Richard Wright's Native Son in 1940 was the first book uh, selected by As a Black American to become a Book of the Month club selection. Gwendolyn Brooks won the Pulitzer Prize. Ralph Ellison's uh, Invisible Man won the National Book Award in 1953. And also James Baldwin was published, Go Tell It on the Mountain in 1950. 53. Next slide, please. As Daphne uh, shared with you, um, among the first uh, publishing companies was the uh, publishing company established by the, the AME Church in uh, Philadelphia, uh, and that was around 1823. So black people continued to publish, like Shirley said, um, the um, the first uh, uh, black newspaper that was published, uh, Freedom Journal. Following that, a number of black newspapers, including North Star, uh, published by Frederick Douglass, and even magazines were published prior to the beginning of the Civil War as our ancestors fought to tell their own story and to, and to define themselves for themselves. Um, now, some of the earlier commercial publishing companies among those also mentioned by Daphne, uh, the Orion Publishing Company, which uh, operated from 1900 to 1911, J.A. Rogers, who uh, was an early historian, um, published a, a number of books uh, between 1917 and 1965, and Associated Publishers 
uh, which started uh, in 1921. Next slide, please. And then in 1942, uh, John Johnson uh, started a publication called the, um, the Negro Digest, uh, which was changed later on in the 60s to Black World. But that magazine established um, uh, an institution uh, in Chicago. It was followed by uh, Ebony Magazine and, and, uh, and the um, several other publications, uh, including Ebony Jr., which was a magazine published starting in 1971 that catered to uh, the, the young adult children, uh, the children's market. And we, you know, black people have continued to uh, tell our stories, to establish our own publishing companies, uh, to define ourselves. And uh, when we started Just Us Books, we were standing on those shoulders. Next slide. And these are just some of the publishing companies um, that were started during the 1960s. As you can see, the, the number of, of Black-owned publishing companies started to really grow in the 60s. Uh, and at the bottom, you see Just Us Books uh, in 1988. But we must give a, a shout out to Third World Press, uh, which was started by uh, Hakeem Abuti and um, that company is still publishing, is still going strong. Uh, Drama and Spear Press in 1969, and Daphne Muse had a lot to do with that. Um, and also uh, Black Classic Press, which was started in 1980 by a friend of ours, Paul Coates. Uh, his son, Ta-Nehisi Coates, you probably know who he is, uh, a very, very successful writer. But Paul's company is still going strong as well. And also Africa World Press, which was sta uh, started in 1983 by Casahome Shikol. Uh, and again, that publishing company is still going strong. So there are basically about five, what we call legacy uh, publishers, black publishing companies that are still publishing uh, uh, major works uh, in the marketplace. And then these are some of the, the black imprints at major US uh, trade publishing houses that was started um, over the last 20, 30 years. And you can sort of see the names. Next slide, please. So let's talk about three real areas of concern for us as children's book publishers. Um, we, we need to talk about who's telling the story. Uh, a lot of the stories that we have in terms of Anansi, in terms of our background in the continent uh, and part of that diaspora, have been erased, uh, have been misrepresented. Uh, the stories that were popular uh, talked about both the content, the context, and the canon. And Daphne really covered that a lot in her presentation. But things that are uh, uh, underlying in our culture, which have such racist uh, implications in terms of language, in terms of the way we see ourselves, in terms of the way we educate ourselves, comes really from the prevalence of the Uncle Remus tales back in the 1880s. Joel Chandler Harris um, collected a number of examples of folk stories told by Black people in the South, and they became a part of a culture that really fed into minstrelly, uh, tar baby, uh, imagery of zippity doo the song of the South, and uh, also Helen Bannerman's uh, book, Little Black Sambo, which was uh, one of the greatest or, or most widely published uh, book on a so-called person of color or black person, Sambo and his family. Uh, and that book is still in print and it has some of the most negative stereotypes of black people that you can find, uh, even though the original story was based in India. So the racist views reflected in these stories uh, are prevalent in our textbooks and in stories that are published today, which are considered um, good stories for, for children. Uh, we recall, again, that The Snowy Day, written by Ezra Jack Keats, was uh, published in 1962, 
but again, Ezra Jack Keats is not a black person, although the story was a black about a black character. Uh, we still need to tell our own stories. Next slide, please. So misrepresentation is still apparent in stories, even like the popular Dr. Seuss, and there have been uh, stories and scholarship written about how uh, the cat in the hat uh, derived from black minstrelly. You can look that up for your further edification. Next slide. We talk a little bit about the Brownies book and how important that was Jesse Redmond, Red, Redmond Fawcett, Langston Hughes, and Augustus Granville Dill started that magazine in the 1920s. And this was a, a foundation of black literature. Next slide. Thank you. In 1932, Popo and Fafina was written collaboratively by Langston Hughes and Anna Bontemps. And it was also illustrated by E. Sims Campbell. And this is one of the first black books in 1932, a long way from 1962. So what's next? Next slide. What we are about uh, is what do we tell the children? Who are they? What do we tell them about themselves, about our history, about our legacy, about our future? We need to tell them the truth. This is a poem that was written by Wade uh, Hudson and illustrated wonderfully by the late Floyd Cooper. What shall we tell the children? Um, and there are good things to tell the children that we have black joy, that all our lives is not, our life did not begin or end in slavery. So what Just Us Books is really about is uh, connecting the dots in our legacy and our history. A lot of this, next slide, please, in terms of, next slide, yes, uh, yeah, uh, came about during the 60s. Uh, first book, really, children's book that I really enjoyed uh, and made me aware of children's literature was written by um, Virginia Hamilton. That's Zealy, which is a classic and has become a standard for Black literature. Next slide, please. And all of this came in terms of my particular background and interest in uh, children's literature from my mother and my father and uh, really ancestors and people in my family who always told us that roots go deep. So it's been a search for uncovering, uh, exposing those roots and how they have nourished us. Next story, next slide. Um, the, the thing that we have learned is that literacy is not just knowing your ABCs or being able to write a paragraph. And I'm most proud of family literacy, finding out although my grandmother was born in 1876 and she was the daughter of a slave, my recent research and family connections have led us to a family Bible, which on the title page was written Henry's book, 1848 which says that Henry, my great-great-grandfather, was literate. At least he could write his name. So we've got to uncover those stories uh, for our children and we do them in a number of ways. Wade. Next slide, please. I grew up during the uh, civil rights period of the 1950s and 1960s, and so did Cheryl. And Mansfield, the town where I was born and raised, had to be the most segregated town in the, in, in the South. And I write about my experiences growing up there in my recently published memoir, Defiant, Growing Up in the Jim Crow South, published by Crown Books for Young Readers. Now, despite the smothering grip of Jim Crow, I grew up in a community that made me know I was loved, that protected me as best it could and encouraged me to be my best, my best self. I always enjoyed writing, but never thought I could become a writer professionally. I didn't have access to books written by black writers. White people chose and approved all the books in our educational system. And those books did not reflect our history, our culture, and our experiences. It wasn't until I attended Southern University that I discovered all the wonderful books that had been written about people like me and by people who look like me. It was then 
that I decided I could become a writer. Next slide, please. And uh, these are scenes from uh, that little small town in Mansfield, population about 5,000 people, about 60% black, uh, but controlled solely by the white power structure. And uh, this is where, where I grew up. Next slide, please. And so um, I started writing when I was like seven or eight years of age. I would sit on the front porch of my, uh, my family's uh, house and just write poems and short stories and essays. As I said earlier, I never really thought that uh, I would become or could become a writer professionally, but it was a gift that I was given and I recognized it as a gift. So I would write just as some of the great singers in my hometown would sing in church uh, to utilize their gifts. But again, I never thought of becoming a professional writer. But at Southern University, that's when I really found out that I could pursue a career as a writer. And so I, I began to really write seriously. I wrote poetry and plays and short stories and essays. And next slide, please. And uh, my playwriting career really took off when I moved to New Jersey. And I had a number of uh, plays produced on the professional stage. Um, as I said earlier, next slide, please. As I said earlier, my coming of age memoir, Defiant, was recently published. And I've written, uh, I have three new books coming out uh, within the next year, two picture books, as well as a middle grade novel. And the middle grade novel is really about uh, what it is like for young people to live in a small town today like the town I grew up in. And um, the publisher is excited about it, and uh, I am as well. Uh, next slide, please. Now, Cheryl and I started Just Us Books in 1988 because we wanted to address the paucity of books for young readers that focused on Black history and Black culture and Black experiences. The Afro Best Kids that you see here to the left were featured in many of our earlier picture books. And these were five characters, um, six characters that Cheryl uh, and I have, had come up with based on uh, a concept that Cheryl had created uh, called the Afro Bets. And I think among our first 10 books, books featuring these uh, characters were, I think, about six or seven of those, of those books. Uh, we joined, next, next slide, please. We joined a small group of black children book creators who had come before us uh, paving the way. And th these are some of them that you see uh, uh, there on the screen. And many of them became uh, friends of ours. They became mentors. Uh, they, they helped to encourage us. And because they were creators, they were writing and illustrating books. And just as books was publishing these books. And they recognized that we were uh, doing something novel and different. You know, we were writing books, but we were also publishing books and publishing books written by others. Many of these uh, trailblazers are, are gone now. I think all of, all of them really are, except for George Ford, who's uh, second uh, on the right, on the second, uh, second row. But everyone else uh, mm. with the ancestors now. Next slide, please. In our publishing program, we publish concept books, board books, picture books, chapter books, books for uh, middle readers, uh, young adult books. And we have uh, fiction, nonfiction, biographies, poetry. And uh, next slide, please. And these are some of the picture books that we've done. Uh, next slide. And these are some of the picture books that we've done. Uh, and we've published a lot. Of, we've given a, a number of black writers an opportunity to be published for the first, the first time. And we are proud, proud of that. Uh, again, these are some of the picture books that we've done. 
Uh, next slide, please. And these are some of the chapter books and the middle grade fiction books. We, we are really excited because we have um, published um, more books that feature black boys as the central characters. Um, that was a problem when we first started Justice Books. Many of the books uh, that were being published had uh, black girls on the, on the cover. And there were fair, very few books that were written to engage uh, black boys. So we, we started a number of series and those series are still still being published. Next, uh, next slide. And these are some of uh, the book on the top left, Book of Black Heroes from A to Z, um, is one of our biggest sellers. Um, that book has, has sold well over 500,000 copies uh, since it's been in print. Uh, and also, uh, Bright Eyes, Brown Skin is a classic. That's one of the books that Cheryl is the author of, and illustrated by George Ford. And that book uh, has a combined sale, sales of over 500,000 as well. Uh, next, next, you can keep going. So these are, again, these are some of the books that we've, we've published. Uh, we mentioned earlier Marimba books. Um, that is a, uh, an imprint uh, that publishes books by uh, more uh, diverse authors, not just uh, black authors. And then Sankofa books on the, the bottom row here is an imprint that we started because a number of uh, black writers would come to us and say the books that they had uh, been published by major publishers were no longer in print, and they wanted to keep those books in print. So uh, we thought it was a good idea, and uh, so we started to uh, bring back to print uh, some of those books written by black authors uh, that had gone out of print. Next, please. And um, we have done a number of partnerships with major publishers. Early on in uh, on our journey, we partnered with Scholastic. We did about 20 titles with them in partnership. And this is our most recent partnership uh, with Crown Books for Young Readers. Uh, and uh, most of these are anthologies that we've done. And we are continuing to do uh, uh, other books in partnership uh, with Crown as well. Next slide, please. Now, today we are talking about so many things that concern our children in terms of the uh, just everyday life. But we have published books as historical fiction as well. Uh, this is an example. Papa's Free Day Party is about uh, a young African-American after uh, enslavement and how he grew up uh, with a family and established uh, himself and his family later in an all-black town in Bowley, Oklahoma. Next slide. That book was written by Marilyn Nelson and illustrated by Wayne Anthony Still. And we still cover books in terms of picture books that cover the diaspora. This is one recent publication, Midnight Speech of Kwame uh, Nkrumah. It's Midnight Speech for Independence. There's so much more that, next slide please, that we can um, talk about uh, because we want to and have a conscious intention of publishing books with cultural substance, authentic stories, realistic depiction of black life that center the black child and not as a sidekick. And yes, our books about black culture and about black history are for all children. Next slide. Um, these are some statistics that really kind of relate how few black books there are and multicultural books. When we started in 1988, um, about 1% uh, of the books that were written and or illustrated by black Americans were among the 3,000 books that were um, recorded as a part of CCBC, the Cooperative Children's Book Center in, uh, the, at the University of Wisconsin in Madison. Since that time, there are other diagraphics uh, uh, demographics have shown that that uh, quantity has increased, but still the preponderance of books that are written are geared toward European history, children of European descent rather than uh, children of color, which is the growing population in the United States of America. Next slide, please. 
So uh, 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 Daphne has uh, shared with us how uh, many of the uh, most recent titles uh, that were announced really on Monday, Monday, the Youth Media Awards were written and illustrated by black authors, Asian American authors, native authors, um, in the terms of the Newbury, the Caldecott, the Coretta Scott King, and other uh, books. So we are encouraged by this growth. But again, we feel that good books make a difference because we can and should and must tell our own stories. Next slide. Ongoing challenges are always there. The 1619 Project has been challenged. Books are being challenged because they are about African-American heritage, because they are about children of color. So this is a major, major concern in terms of what is supposed to be a, doc, uh, uh, a democratic society. And we've seen some of uh, the uproar in uh, Florida about books being now that we've had more books being published, uh, what is Governor DeSantis trying to do? He's trying to erase them. He's trying to make them not available to students. So this is something in terms of practice and policy that Just Us Books is committed to, and we're committed to our books, which some of which have been banned or challenged in some situations, but always grounded, again, that books about, for, about Black children are central to uh, literacy and learning and the universality of literature and storytelling uh, in our communities. Next slide. <laughs> Good books make a difference. We want to thank you again for allowing us to make this presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And I must we say, wish we were there with you, but. <laughs> <laughs> well, I have to say also that um, Afrobet's books were in my household when my brothers were growing up. I'm a little bit older, so it was nice to see, um, to, to put the authors to the, the cover of those books that were, that were part of my household and my upbringing. So thank you for be being here virtually. Our thank next. You. Thank you. Our next speaker is Dr. Awan Mance, who is the author and illustrator of A Thousand and One Black Men, Portraits of Masculinity at the Intersections, that was published in 2022. Um, and I asked Dr. Um, Mance to sign my copy of the book. <laughs> um, and also uh, of the book um, Living While Black, Portraits of Everyday Resistance, also published in 2022. Um, Awan will release a new children's book in the fall of 2023. Awan's illustrations and comics have appeared in several collections, including We're Still Here, winner of the 2019 Ignatz Award for Outstanding Anthology, Drawing Power, winner of the 2020 Eisner Award for Best Anthology, and COVID Chronicles, a comics anthology, and many, many others. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Awan Mance. Thank you for the introduction. Um, it's a real pleasure to be here. And um, it's also a pleasure to be among so many like-minded people. Um, I am going to go back to my uh, first slide. And as you can see, I, too, am going to talk about Brownie's book. So um, um, I just want to share a few comments today about, um, you know, um, I, I am an, a literary historian of the black 19th century um, by training and by my scholarly interest. But I am also a visual artist and illustrator. And um, both of those things come together. Um, the history of black representation is what informs the work that I create today as an artist. Um, and particularly, um, I'm interested in when black people create representations of themselves either written or illustrated or both for black people. It's a very different voice. Um, 
it's a very different set of subjects that are represented. Um, yet those kinds of works rarely make their way into the canon. Um, um, when you go to your average American literature course, and even sometimes African American literature courses, you may not encounter some of those specific black writers who published through the AME Church in the 19th century and other small publishers. They were big in the black community. Um, uh, the Colored um, American, um, the AME Reporter, these were critical um, publications in the 19th century in which African Americans wrote all types of poetry, prose for all ages for each other. And those are some of the most important voices, um, but they, they get lost. And so I just wanna um, walk through a few images um, and talk a little bit about the history of African American people creating images for each other and particularly for black children and then talk a little bit about my own engagement in this particular world um, of illustration for black people. I create books for all ages as well as more recently, um, as I said, um, I can't give the title right now, but um, my child children's book, my first uh, children's specific book will be out in the fall. And so my title is Children of the Sun, uh, Black Children's Books, Children of the Sun, and we'll see why that is in a moment. But first, I want to begin with this illustration. Um, you know, black writing for children has been taking place for a long time. And you know, Daphne Muse discussed that um, as well. Um, and um, I want to earmark this particular piece. It's called Little Danzy's One Day at Sabbath School by a woman named Gertrude Bastille Moselle. She was from an, uh, what one could call an elite African-American family of educated professionals. She married into an elite African-American family. Um, and she was a polymath. She did all types of things. She wrote poetry, she did activism, and she sit, sat down to put pen to paper to write one of the earliest uh, um, Sunday school books that focused on black children. Um, and just to uh, inject a little humor for a moment, Little Danzy's One Day at Sabbath School um, is a really, um, uh, today I think it could be considered humorous, but Danzy only has one day at Sabbath school. She's very sweet, almost to the level of being saccharine. Um, she's so giving on her way to Sabbath school, wide-eyed, you can just see it in your mind. Um, but she ends up stopping a train with her body to protect another person. And this is what is modeled, you know, and this is the early 20th century, late 19th century, and if you're at all familiar with Sunday school books of that time period, the really, really good children have something terrible happen to them because they've sacrificed themselves for someone else. And so um, Mrs. N.F. Moselle wrote a book that's very much in genre for the time, um, but it was pioneering once again in that it was a Sunday school book that focused on African-American, an African-American child, a little black girl, and it got quite a bit of traction in its time. And this is a photo of um, Gertrude Bastille, or Mrs. N.F. Moselle. Um, I wanted to, um, you know, early in the 20th century, representations of black people um, in the media were highly problematic, and that's probably an understatement. Um, you know, we, um, I, I do always try to maintain some optimism about the position of black people in the United States today, and being a literary historian really helps me do that. Um, when you look at some of the early representations in film in particular, um, highly problematic, very troubling stereotypes. And so um, in uh, October of 1919, W.E.B. Du Bois wrote an essay called The True Brownies in the Crisis Magazine. And in that essay, he announced that starting in 2020, there was going to be a magazine for black children. It was going to be called Brownies Book. It was going to have um, probably greater funding than most such magazines had and uh, probably a broader reach. But what I thought was particularly important was the list of goals, why black children needed this publication. Um, to make them familiar with the history and achievements of the Negro race, to make them know that other colored children have grown into beautiful, useful, and famous persons, to teach them a delicate code of honor and action in their relations with white children. Um, they go low, we go high, as another way of saying that. Um, 
to turn their little hurts and resentments into emulation, ambition, and love of their homes and companions, to point out the best amusements and joys and worthwhile things of life, and to inspire them to prepare for definite occupations and duties with a broad spirit of sacrifice, so service to the community. But I do want to go back to the first thing um, that's listed here, to make colored children realize that being colored is a normal, beautiful thing. Black is Beautiful was not introduced in the 1960s. Black is Beautiful was pervasive in late 19th century thinking. And then when we come to 1919, also W.E. Du Bois, B. Du Bois says, this is what we need for children to know. Um, I also want to focus on 1919 because that was a really terrible year for black people. Um, we have the red summer of 1919 in which there are bloody race riots uh, throughout the United States, um, from Elaine, Arkansas, all the way up through Boston. And I know there are many other places I'm missing out on. Um, seems that when people uh, return from the war um, and the uh, flu epidemic, one of the first things they wanted to do was reclaim space and um, use African-American bodies to establish, reestablish dominance. And so with that, along with the release of some highly troubling film and other representations, the Crisis Magazine believed that it needed to act. And Brownie's book was one of its creations. And you've already seen this cover in the previous presentation, the first Brownie's book ever. And what's so important at this time is that there's a little black girl on the cover and she's an angel. Um, and so the idea of centering the, the beauty, the divinity of a black child, very important at this time. Um, a monthly magazine, this is the Brownies book, a monthly magazine for children of the sun, designed for all children, but especially ours. Something that belongs to black people. And then the association of black people um, with you know, that heritage of, of being people of Africa, um, people of the South, um, both the global South and the American South, the idea of people of the sun. What I also want to mention, and you can't talk about um, representations of black people, especially in the first half of the 20th century, without talking about colorism. And it's incredibly important that in the first issue of Brownie's book, we have a little black girl who is not a light-skinned child. That's critically important. Um, if you're familiar at all with the Crisis Magazine, um, often the Crisis Magazine would have a page of black babies, um, just giving people a sense of what the black community looks like. And in many cases, those were babies who represented the black elite. Sometimes there was the picture of a young black woman on the cover. Oftentimes, colorism got the best of how the black elite formed itself and also aesthetics of the editors and, um, and um, light-skinned black people in those early issues of the crisis are overrepresented. But this is a powerful statement by um, Brownie's book in this first issue. Um, one of the most important things that Brownie's book did, and I didn't include more interior images, um, I could have gone really far with this, but I didn't want to. Um, there are a lot of photographs of black children at different activities, at school, at camp, um, pictures of lots of little black children playing. Um, the idea of black children being able to see themselves and each other to get a sense that they are not the only ones and what blackness looks like. Um, one of the things that I think is so important is that in representations, for black people, art means possibility. Um, and for black children, representations of black children and black adults in media for black children show black children what they can be, what is possible. And so um, one of the things, messages, the pervasive messages throughout most of the photographs and the illustrations inside and on the cover of Brownie's book is the idea that black children can have joy and pleasure. And so we see happy black children. I think that this image from March of 1920 is so important because we see black children in this kind of a little black girl in this kind of fantastic, you know, fantasy-based realm, giving black children permission to imagine 
permission to play. That's something that still today is um, given all of the things that are happening in this moment, but that have been happening in, you know, for, for quite a while now. Um, the idea of black people giving themselves permission to imagine, to be free, to play. Um, is, is so important and essential to our survival. We have play and humor and storytelling and fantasy as a part of our heritage, um, dating back to the first stories told by human beings. And so for us to lose that um, really is under duress. Um, pictures like this give black children possibility to re-engage that playful aspect of black culture. Um, just wanted to show some other images. Brownie's book, because it was by black people, for black people, often falls off the radar in literary history. And so I just think it's so important to see um, this example of loving blackness as political resistance. If you're familiar with that Bell Hooks essay of the same title and that concept that one of the most powerful things that people of all ethnicities can do in fighting white supremacy and other forms of injustice, is to love that thing which is supposed to be least lovable in the United States, and that would be blackness. Um, and so what a powerful example of loving blackness as political resistance, um, the crisis bringing artists in to draw um, loving um, photos, uh, or not photos, loving um, drawings, illustrations of black children. And so, um, I wanted to jump into, um, you know, the Brownies book establishes, it doesn't last, it doesn't live for very long, but it sets um, a precedent for people to engage more thoroughly with writings for black children. It, there, have all, there was already writing for black children before Brownies book. Brownies book puts it front and center. Um, with a, kind of a manifesto of why this needs to be done. And so we continue to see black publications creating images, art, black publishers for, by and for black children. We saw something of a history of that with our previous um, uh, presenters. Um, and yet, once again, black media created for black people, by black people, did not get the attention that it deserved. 1962, the book The Snowy Day is not the first children's book written with a black protagonist, but it is the first such book to win uh, this uh, Caldecott Medal, um, if I'm reading it correctly. If, yeah. And um, one of the reasons is because um, Ezra Jack Keats was an established illustrator um, who was not black. Um, and so when he produced this book, people could see it could actually see, oh, a book by, um, about black children by someone we can trust for this representation. Now, I don't want to disparage Ezra Jack Keats or his work. Um, one of the fun facts about A Snowy Day is it is still the most checked out book at the New York Public Library in the entire system. Um, so it is a beloved text and beloved by black people as well. But Really important to know that black people had been doing this work all along, but it's only when we see a white writer engage that it becomes visible. Um, fortunately, by the time we get to 1976, we see um, Why Mosquitoes Buzz in People's Ears being the first Caldecott Metal book by black illustrators. Um, and this book is, you know, and if there is a canon of children's literature, it's a beautifully, as you can see, innovatively illustrated book that is rooted in African-American folklore, or not Afro, African-American, but Afro-diasporic folklore. And so it's really, if you haven't had a chance to take a look at this book, it's really powerful and beautiful and, and fun. And of course, history making. Um, I want to just jump to you know, the idea of the importance of black children um, being able to engage with depictions of themselves and other black people. Black people of all ages, of course, it's also important for black children to see representations of black adults, um, but also the notion of black children, the idea of what's possible. There's also a degree to which black representations of black children give black children permission to explore different, um, different places, different spaces, um, alternatives to what they have been 
uh, taught is the space for blackness um, in a very limited realm that mainstream media and mainstream books often create. And as we saw with the statistics in the last presentation, mainstream uh, publishing often creates a space for blackness that's a non-space. More animals depicted as protagonists of children's books than black children. And so I wanted to share a little bit from some of the work that I'm doing around representations of blackness. Um, and this is, um, I didn't have this as a part of the presentation until um, last night, and I thought, you know, why don't I share this? Because the project wrapped on uh, 3 a.m. Um, on Tuesday. And that is um, the idea of using representations of black children for public health advocacy. This is a project through, um, 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 it's grant funded and supported by the National Council of Negro Women um, and um, will be getting out into people's hands during this month of February. It's called Queenie Gets Her Shots and it's a coloring book that is effectively a children's book but children can color in the illustrations. Um, and in this book we see a child being encouraged to get their um, vaccinations um, through a um, a uh, kind of a um, tour of the roles that black scientists have played in the development of vaccines from polio um, all the way back actually earlier than that to the uh, 17th century and the 18th century in particular with Monismus who introduced the notion of inoculation to Boston um, through his uh, the person who was uh, uh, considered himself to own him at the time for inoculation against smallpox. We come up to um, the uh, doctors um, uh, Henderson and Thompson at Tuskegee Institute who played such a critical role in the development of the polio vaccine. And then um, more recently we see the African-American woman physician who played such an important role in developing mRNA uh, technology for the COVID-19 vaccine. And so in this particular book, children see a black child in you know, learning about this integral history, uh, black, how black people have been integral to public health efforts throughout um, the West's most um, trying moments in uh, history. And then um, just to finish up in my own work, um, representing black children plays a very important role. Once again, the notion of black possibility. Um, one of the things that I appreciate about some of the images we've already seen, and in some ways um, it's part of the liberation that the 1960s black arts movement has brought to black people, that we, have, we can rely less on this notion of positive representation and lean more into the idea of a multiplicity of representations. There are many black experiences, there are many black truths and many black lives. And so in my own illustration, in my own children's um, work and in a book like, these are two illustrations from Living Wild Black, which is a book for all ages, but apparently has been picked up um, as a book for younger readers. One of the important um, things for me is just to show a multiplicity of black children some happy, some sad, um, in different settings. Black people um, in their full diversity, not necessarily something as prescriptive as what blackness should look like or a representation of what blackness should be on a good day, the good representation, but more voices and more representation. It's one of the most important developments in the rise of black children's literature the idea of moving beyond the uh, role model to all models, many truths of blackness. Thank you. All right, we have one last speaker. Crystalyn Sanders Diggs, uh, who is an author and child sexual abuse advocate dedicated to using her writing to educate and empower children. With a background in criminal justice, political science, and ethnic studies, she has made it her mission to prevent child sexual abuse and promote positive self-esteem in young readers. 
As a mother, Crystalline is passionate about providing children with the tools they need to develop confidence and strength in the face of life's challenges. In her work as an advocate, she is committed to making a positive impact on the lives of children. Crystalline lives in Northern California with her husband and son uh, who provide her with love and support. Um, she has provided, you can see a display of her books um, and is available to talk afterwards uh, about her books uh, and other resources on child sexual abuse prevention. Um, and also um, we'll have information about her website on uh, our website. And with that, I will um, hand it over to Crystalline Sanders-Dix. Hello, everyone. Um, as you've heard, my name is Crystalline Sanders-Diggs. And when I got the call to be here, I was so honored. And I'm still honored to be here. So, so thank you so much to everyone and for inviting me. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit um, in a, you know, about my history and about why I started writing children's books. And then we'll move into our Q&A. In 2021, my niece, who was eight years old, reported that she was being sexually abused. At just eight years old, um, it just really impacted my family. And a little bit about me. Um, I'm a California State University East Bay graduate. I have degrees in ethnic studies, political science, and criminal justice. I also have a master's degree in political science. And I thought, you know, I have all of these degrees, all of this education. Why did this happen to a child close to me? Why did this happen to a family member of mine? What is going on? And so I took action. Um, I will, first, we stopped healing, of course, justice. Um, her predator and perpetrator is currently behind bars, serving 56 years to life in prison, as he should. And then it was a journey of healing. Um, my niece came to live with me, and we started doing things, things that would make us happy. What would make us happy? We started playing, took her to Disneyland. Come on, let's go to Disneyland, let's go to Legoland. Uh, we were in intensive trauma therapy. And then as I was helping her through her healing journey, she went back to live with her mother. And then I began my healing journey. Um, Unfortunately, her abuse and her trauma brought up some things that had happened to me in my childhood, and I needed to heal that and address that. And so through my therapy, I started writing, writing children's books, writing things down, writing poetries and poems. And I said, you know what? There needs to be more information to children and children of color about these taboo topics and what happens in the black household and some social things that you know are going on. So I wrote my first book. Well, first I took a look at the landscape. Why did this happen to my niece? What is the information out there that could be told to children about sexual abuse to help them protect their bodies and what to do if they're ever harmed. And I looked at the landscape of books that are out there and unfortunately, this many, zero, depict black children, um, unfortunately. Um, so none of the books out there that are on the subject of body safety, consent, and boundaries depict black children. Uh, the information is lacking. And so I had to do something about it. So I wrote my first book, Where Hands Go, The Introduction to Safe and Unsafe Touch. And it has a black little girl on the cover. A lot of, in the sexual abuse community, unfortunately, we put a lot of the responsibility on children to uh, protect their bodies and to provide a safe environment for themselves. But unfortunately, it's also about educating families and parents about keeping your environments safe. So my books provide information to educate both the family 
as well as the child. And I decided to use bright, bold colors and to depict the black family um, in a positive light. So after this book, <laughs> I decided I found a passion for writing children's books. Um, as a mother, I went into my son's room and I said, you know what? We need, to, we need to change this. I want his room to be filled with black books. Um, and unfortunately, well, fortunately, there are a lot, but there aren't enough. So I started writing more books. All of my books feature children of color, black children. But what all of my books do, which is very unique, is we def as they depict diversity in its, in its, at its core. It's, not just black families in general, not just black mom, black dad. It's sometimes you might have a Latin mom and a black dad. Sometimes you might have a white mom and a black dad. So I really wanted to diversify the family depiction throughout my books. So I hope that you look at them and check them out. Um, but that is my story and that is how I write children's books and why I continue to write children's books because I believe that there needs to be more diversity and representation in children's books and not just okay, we need child literature that is, depicts black children, but we need to show that there is diversity in skin tone and color as well as families. So I hope to depict that in my books currently and come forthcoming. So thank you so much for having me and it's an honor to be here. Okay. Um, First, I want to make sure that the Hudsons are back with us on screen, on Zoom. Great, wonderful, thank you. Um, and I want to give another round of applause to all of our panelists and to Ms. Muse for organizing such a rich discussion. I'm gonna ask a couple of questions um, and hopefully this will give you all some time to formulate your own questions. Um, we'll open it up to a Q&A in maybe five or 10 minutes or so. Um, I wanna start, um, I guess one of the things I'm so struck by in all of the presentations uh, is how many black writers and art, visual artists have made children's books from, you know, from early on. And I wanna ask you all um, if you could talk a little bit about what, what makes a children's book, a black children's book, a black children, a children's book in, in voice, in narrative, uh, in structure, in image. How does your writing or your art or your focus shift, necessarily have to shift to convey that story? Um, and I'm especially, you know, b struck by your your conversation, Crystalyn. You know, this is so important and such heavy, difficult information. Um, and as well, you, Awan, talking about, you know, how does your art shift when you are depicting black children for black children? Well, I'm black, <laughs> and I'm a black writer. And so um, I don't think it necessarily needs to shift in terms of my writing. I just, I'm well aware that I want to write for the child inside me and for my child. What lessons do I want him and other black children to learn? Um, what information do black families need to see? Um, so it doesn't necessarily change. I write for the young child in me who was deprived of uh, black literature um, representation and um, the depiction of healthy black families in children's books. So I write for my child and me. <laughs> I um, When I'm writing for children, um, you know, I would say my answer is somewhat similar. I'm black and so that definitely takes center stage. Um, but I also think um, there's a level of complexity. Um, there are some ways in which I want to be unambiguous when I'm writing for children. And so um, 
when I'm doing, I also do some comics, and some of my comics have um, uh, African American people um, kind of on a journey of kind of self exploration, you know, moving towards a place of self love. Um, I don't generally put that type of complexity in my drawings for children. I want the represent their children's lives are incredibly complex. They're trying to figure out how to be on the planet without a guidebook. Um, <laughs> and so in terms of blackness, I want that love to be unconditional. Um, there should be, for me, when I create the books, I want there to be an undercurrent of celebration of black people. Um, and um, I don't want anything in my representations to, to suggest the notion of limits on what's possible. Um, and then the story might have some complexity. Um, um, but in and of itself, the work um, is about you know that unconditional love of blackness, a celebration of blackness. And in as much as someone can glean something about the person who's creating the book, um, I want to be the adult who they say, well, this adult really likes black people. Um, if, if they think about me, um, probably I would just recede into the mist <laughs> if the book really kind of occupies them. But I want them to, if they do think about me, think, oh yeah, this is a person who really loves black people too. Can I come in on that? Can you, can you hear me? You can? Yeah, I, in, in, in publishing, um, we use the term in children's uh, publishing, but they are different age groups uh, that uh, make up children's literature. Um, normally, from a marketing perspective, there's two to five, six to, to eight, and nine to 12. And the kind of images that you use, uh, the, the words, the number of words in the text all depend upon uh, the age category that you're writing from. Um, and um, again, I, I think that that's, that's crucial. Um, I have written for the adult market. I've written plays, I've written um, novels, um, poetry. Um, and I've also written for children. I've written picture books for children. And I've written chapter books for children. And I've written middle grade novels for children. And each of those categories uh, require a, a, a different kind of uh, mentality in terms of what you're, how you're gonna approach it. Thank you. Um, I have three little guides that kind of bebop around with me. Scree Bob and Murkatroyd, the mad black scientist, Scree Better, his partner, and Scree Bad, their child. And those three little spirits kind of guide me through this world of children's and young adult literature, understanding that human beings are not linear. We are not flat. We are multidimensional, multifaceted, and children come in all kinds of complex dynamics. Some of them are really cool. Some of them ain't so cool. Uh, some are cool sometimes. It's a combination thing. And you can't say, I feel you don't write for a child that you write with multiple kinds of children in mind, although a book can be tailored for the interest of a specific child. Um, I also want to reiterate that there are authors like June Jordan, Julius Lester, who have taken on some really difficult, and Jacqueline Woodson, who have taken on some really, really hard topics in children's and young adult literature. Julius Lester wrote a novel when dad, when, when daddy, or when dad murdered mom. People were livid about that book. But that book depicted a reality mm -hmm. 
that book, there were children who needed to come to terms with what that meant in their own families. And that was bold of him to do. That was really courageous of him to do. It was a gut-wrenching read, you know, and I had to kind of go on sabbatical, <laughs> spiritual sabbatical <laughs> for a few weeks after I read it to recompose myself. But I think that the notion of writing for a singular child doesn't for me, that doesn't work, that there are just so many complexities. And there are also things that are very, very simple, uh, things related to nature, things related to everyday functions in our lives. But there's also the layeredness of being a human being. Thank you for that. Um, I'm going to ask one more question, um, and I was really struck, really moved by what you were saying, Dr. Mance, about um, the urgency of depicting complexity. Um, and I, you know, was thinking about, um, you know, dear Dr. Du Bois. Uh, and his criteria, like criteria for Negro children's art. Um, and, you know, there's joy and beauty and the possibility of imagination, um, the normalization of being black, but also his criteria are, were really about a kind of um, racial uplift, right? And a politics of respectability. Um, and you know, so I want us to you know think about you know, thinking about what it means to depict a range of emotions, the urgency of experiences. Um, the last one of your your three muses, I can't remember. Really bad, she bad. No, no, scree bobbin. Oh. Scree bobbin. Scree bobbin, Mercatroy. Okay. Scree better. <laughs> And scree bad is the kid. And scree bad. But bad in a good way. Oh, okay. Okay. Well, you know, I'm thinking about and bad. <laughs> um, well, you know, I'm also thinking about bad as in baby's kids. Yeah, right? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> like, some of that too. You know, you know, how do we make space for in children's literature to love the you know, the unlovable, right? The to make space for the for um, those kinds of, you know, for the regular, a celebration of the regular, um, you know, for those difficult emotions, for, um, you know, for the everyday and not just the heroes. And so, um, you know, love to hear you say, anyone say more about that, but also about, you know, what you think are the, the urgent directions that the field of black children's literature needs to, uh, needs to take. More, more about LGBTQ and trans children, for sure. That is an area that has only scratched the surface. And more books about children with disabilities, where it's not just one character in the book, but that the flow of their lives is as acceptable and regular as our lives are. And one of the things that I really um, find, I really wish could happen more is, I doubt that maybe three or four black children's books have been put into Braille. And that diminishes, that, that excludes a whole population that is eager to see themselves, hear themselves, while children who are hearing impaired or deaf, they have the opportunity for translation. But children who are blind they don't have, and these, these black children's books are not being created in Braille. I think I've seen one in the more than 60 years that I've been doing this, this work. 
So there's a lot of room for growth. And I think those of you sitting in this audience, those in the fellows in the BCS program, that there are opportunities for you to write these critically needed books. I would also say um, all of those things. Um, I think about the book, The Princess Boy, which I believe is banned in some in some jurisdictions, um, but uh, does uh, you know from a mother writing for you know in some ways you reminded me of that notion of seeing a need in the children you know and then creating the work. Um, but I would like to see more uh, children's books that. Um, complicate um, things like uh, engage more with class diversity. Um, it's an interesting moment for um, children's book publishers who are not um, black, um, who are especially large publishers, because of the um, pushback on books about black people that talk about the fact that racism is real. Um, and so, um, the idea of trying to come up with positive representations um, represent that kind of uh, adhere mostly to either bootstrapping narratives or um, middle class and upper middle class representation, but also um, the need to tell historical stories about black people from the past, both the uh, you know inventors and activists who did great things, but also the the moments of struggle. I think that um, you know, as a literary historian, the um, AP uh, conundrum around Black history has hit me very hard. I'm yeah. very, very troubled by that, and I do think that Black children's books could fill a little bit of the gap there. Thank you. Um, we have a couple of mics. I think if anyone has any questions, you want to ask. I have more questions, so I always have questions. I think um, right here. Gentleman there, yes. Uh, this has been a very, very uplifting uh, seminar uh, for me. I want to uh, address the issue of complexity and, and nuance, and also uh, in publishing. I think these books are so important, but I'm, I'm concerned uh, black children books are, are not limited to black children. I think it would be wonderful if, um, if other groups could be exposed to this literature, and I don't know how that would be done. Oh, that, that's being done, and the movement in black children's literature is what then produced or opened the doors for more Asian American writers, more Latinx, um, more native indigenous writers. That, that really, black authors did a lot to bring along others whose voices were marginalized, whose voices were stereotyped. Uh, so, and I witnessed that as during the time that I was working at Drum and Spear Bookstore in Washington, D.C. And we had a section in the bookstore called Third World Children's Literature. And this was 1969. <laughs> and we were recognizing the fact that our voices were not only lifting our people, but they were also bringing others along. Uh, uh, do they have access to these books? And what is a good, uh, I think they should, obviously. <laughs> and a, uh, what is the strategy for, for, being sh for, for promoting that or realizing that other groups are reading, other children of, of other groups uh, have access to, these, to this literature? If, if I could uh, just, can you hear me? Uh, if I could just add something in, in answer to that question, I think that as uh, publishers, just us books, uh, some people think it's justice books. Uh, it's really just us, Wade and myself and the staff that supports us. But um, uh, our books are written for the black child in us, the black child that we didn't see for our children. It came out of that 
need. But that doesn't mean that the stories that we talk about, whether it's Bright Eyes, Brown Skin, or Jamal's Busy Day, or Kid Caramel solving a, a detective a mystery in his neighborhood, or a, from a child's heart, a child speaking to, to God, uh, or, or any of those uh, everyday, normal uh, emotions, uh, activities that all children are engaged in, children in our books are engaged in, and they are Black children who are centered. So the question becomes not, uh, some people think, okay, because you have a Black child in the book, that is for a Black child. Uh, if you have a white child in the book, is that book just for a white child? It's assumed that if there's a white child in the book, uh, centered in the book, it's universal somehow. But if it's a marginalized uh, uh, a person of color, then it's sort of a, a niche thing. And that's not the, the problem. The problem is the marketing and the mindset of, you know, just racist behavioral uh, biases that have been a part of our culture in this country from time immemorial that says that because a book is culturally specific, it means it's not available to others. And our books are available to anybody who wants to buy them, to people who don't want to buy them. Um, it's, it's a marketing concern uh, rather than a, a concern of how do we make them available to other people. The books are available through uh, bookstores, through websites, through independent presses, through Amazon. Um, they, they are widely available. It's a matter of having people go to those places to, to and learn that they are there. Yeah, and just to add to what Cheryl is saying, um, this whole book banning uh, effort that has taken place over the last few years, uh, been amped up over the last few years, I think is a uh, reaction to the fact that many of the books that are being published, diverse books uh, written by a, a wide variety of people from this country, whether they are Black or, uh, or Asian Pacific or whatever, are getting into the hands of white children. They are reading these books. So I think, you know, those who want to narrow how America is seen and viewed to a white perspective, recognize that. So they are trying to now stop these books from getting into the hands of, of um, all children, not just black children. Um, and I think there are a number of reading clubs where these books are being featured. Um, there are teachers in, in, in the educational system that are um, recognizing the importance of having a diverse offering of books. Uh, as ancillary to to the the regular textbooks, uh, so there there is a movement, and I think because there has been a movement, and authors like Kwame uh, Alexander, um, who else? Uh, Jackie Woodson. They travel. They do a lot of events. They do a lot of promotion, uh, promotional work to get their books out there. We do as well at Just Us Books, and I think what going back to what Daphne uh, said earlier, Black book creators have been at the forefront of getting books into the greater marketplace. And because they've been at the forefront, uh, other writers of color have joined us. So there's a more of a team effort to change the, the, the playing field, so to speak. And that's why the progress that has been made has been made. It's not because publishing companies recognize that um, there needs to be more diverse books. It's because Black people and other people of color, Black authors, well, Black book creators are pushing, you know, and not allowing them to use the same old excuses uh, to, to not have more diverse books. Yeah, and just to go off that, it's not just Black people and Black creators who are pushing um, for diversity um, and 
these books into classrooms. It is everyone in our society. There is a slow wave that is happening where teachers yeah. and educators of all different races are recognizing the need for diverse books in classrooms. And the gateway to exposing children who are of non-black or non not black to black children's books or children's books depicting black characters is through parents and educators. So if parents and educators can recognize and appreciate the need for having a myriad and a diversity of books that their children read or are exposed to, that that helps. So I personally go to a lot of events in the Bay Area to market my books and to you know present my books. And I will tell you that the majority of the people who purchase my books, unfortunately, are not black. Um, the majority of the ch children and people who purchase my books are of non-black. Um, they're not. They're not black. So, um, and it's sad, but it's it's the reality. Well, they identify facing. with the subject of the book. Yes, my subject. The subjects of my books yeah. um, relate to all children, regardless yeah. of their color. Um, one of my books is called A Girl Named Rainbow, which is about having a unique name and how that unique name could be part of your history or your culture. So embracing that name that you were given, even if it's Crystal Lynn or Cheryl or whatever your name may be, um, whatever culture you're from, embrace your name and love your name. And I think that that's relatable to all cultures. Um, yeah. Can I just oh. say, okay, things. The name thing, when the shift took place in the 60s, and Shaniqua hit the set, and Javaka, and Amir, people went nuts. <laughs> Absolutely off the chain. But Amir, and Shaniqua, and Javaka, the stories about their lives were just absolutely fun, often, and wonderful. The second thing I want to talk, make, make a point about is, and this is Awan's world, is black comic books have been around for decades. You go back to the 40s. And Marvel had some characters that were historical books on Frederick Douglass, on Martin Luther King, on there was even a comic book on Toussaint Louverture. So, and then in the 60s and 70s, there was Luther, who was in the comic strips. There was Maury Turner's, We Pals. So the comic but strip. But we republished. Pardon? We, we republished. Uh, we pass. Good. Yeah. Good. Because those comics were kind of a turning point for some of the shows, some of the comic shows that came on television. And I think that Awan's experience in Comic Con and the world of comics and what she's been able to explore and do, somebody could teach a course just on black comic books. And I think it would be a fascinating course, not only from the creative power of what those books have done, but the historical content of them as well. I actually want to say that um, my dear colleague and friend, Dr. Derek Scott, is teaching a course on black comics oh, and, and superheroes and queer fantasy. Um, so yes, all of that is made available. Um, Unfortunately, we are at time. It's 2.30, a little after 2.30. Um, we will be here. Let's see if I can get to the um, our last slide. But we will be here next week um, for a presentation curated by one of our dissertation fellows, Caleb Dawson. It's called Caught Caring. Unfreedom and the costs of service labor in the university. So we've gone from children's literature and thinking about the early work um, of educating folks to thinking about what it means to be in these spaces and in these institutions of learning. Um, please, please join us next week. Um, our panelists, some of our panelists will be here if you want to talk to them directly. Uh, and thank you so much. Sure, um, but I know some people do have to leave, so I just want to give space for people who have to who have time. Mm -hmm.
Thank you. Great sharing with everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you.